The book of Ezra tells the story of the people coming back from captivity, and they have this big ceremony where they lay the foundation for the temple. And it says that some people are weeping and others are shouting for joy. So with the foundation laid, you might think, then they're going to get to work pretty soon on this temple and have it built and start using it again. But as it turns out, there's conflict over who gets to be involved in the building of the temple, and so nothing happens on it for 16 years. So that would be like if the foundation were laid in 2006, and here we are in 2022, and no progress has been made. But then the Lord sends the prophet Haggai to the people, and he says to them, is it time yet to build the house of the Lord? Because he says to them, set your heart on your ways. Think about what you've been doing. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified. He says, and then another part, he says, you dwell in paneled houses, and yet you say, it's not time to rebuild the house of the Lord. They'd had time in those 16 years to build pretty nice houses for themselves, but the house of the Lord had been neglected. And so the prophet's saying, uh, let's think about what you're doing. And to the people's credit, they act. They feel convicted by their conscience, and the governor and the high priest and the people all are motivated by the Lord to get to work. And so we read this. It says, And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did what was useful in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. Such a beautiful picture of people coming together, convicted by their conscience, motivated to work and do their part to build a house for the Lord. And I wish we could end the story there. Wouldn't that be nice? But of course, the story doesn't end there. Like we heard in the children's talk, a month into the work, and they are ready to quit because it doesn't look as good as it could look. And so what's the point? The teachings of the new church tell us that we are meant to be like temples of God. Listen to this passage. It says, According to Paul, we are temples of God. The goal, intention, and objective for us as temples of God is our salvation and eternal life. Salvation and eternal life relate to our will, our heart, where our goal, intention, and objective reside. As we go along, we take in teachings about faith and charity from our parents, teachers, and preachers. When we come into our own judgment, we take teachings about faith and charity from the Word and religious books. These are all means to an end. These means have to do with our intellect. Finally, we end up being useful by following teachings as the means, and this happens through the physical actions called good works. This is how we become temples of God. So again, it's a beautiful picture. We have a sincere desire to be good people, to get to heaven, to be angels, to serve the Lord, and so we learn teachings from other people and eventually from the Lord's word directly, and we try to do good, useful things and become temples of God. But just like the children of Israel dutifully trying to work on that temple, we can sometimes be a little bit disappointed in the results of our work. As Haggai says to the people, is it not, as it were, nothing in your eyes? So let's look at this experience of being disappointed in our work as an individual and also as a community. As individuals, it's easy to feel disappointed. Disappointed in how a particular project worked out, disappointed in how our lives seem to have brought us to a particular point, and disappointed in general about how far short of our ideals we find ourselves. And it's particularly hard when we've put some effort in, you know, because if we didn't really try, then at least we have that excuse. Well, I didn't try, so I didn't succeed, so it's fine. But if we tried and still failed, ouch. And we can experience this in all different parts of our lives, in our professional life, in our personal life, even in our hobbies and creative pursuits. We can feel rather disappointed and like a failure in even those things that are supposed to be fun. But let's look at what it 
feels like in the area of spiritual development. Because you might have some fuzzy memories from your childhood or something of a time when things were better, when you just had that trust. You knew there was a God, you knew he cared for you, you knew he was looking out for everything. It was good. Like those fuzzy memories that people had, there was that temple back in Jerusalem, wasn't it good? But somehow as an adult, you can't always access that place of trust. There's a lot more doubt and wondering and angst. And our meager efforts to try to read the Lord's word and understand it and put it into practice can seem kind of like nothing in our eyes. So this feeling that we're kind of not anywhere useful is understandable, but let's just question it gently a little bit. And here I find teachings from the Lord's Word and the teachings of the new church really helpful about how faith develops, particularly the teachings about what's sometimes called historical faith or handed down faith. This is faith or belief that has been handed down to us by other people, by parents or grandparents or mentors or people who we care about and who we respect and whose beliefs are really influential to us, their values. We want to live those values out too. And this handed down faith that we get is a good starting point, but by itself, it's not alive, it's not flexible, it's not real and saving. This is how one passage from the teachings of the new church talks about handed down faith. It says, handed down faith is believed because another person has said it. Handed down faith is like belief in things unknown. I believe it because someone else said, I don't know for myself. And yet spiritual faith is such that in it, truths themselves are seen and consequently believed. So when we believe something because someone we believe in said it was true, that's not quite the same. If we want to have real spiritual faith, then we need to take the things we've been told by other people and go back to the Lord's word and examine it and see where it seems to line up with what the Lord's word says and see where it doesn't seem to line up and work on that. And even more important than that intellectual work is the work to try to live it out. Another passage about handed down faith says this, handed down faith becomes saving in a person when he or she learns truths from the word and lives according to them. And when we start trying to live according to the truths, again, it's not gonna look very pretty because we can have these unrealistic expectations of ourselves. And this is a place where I feel bad for my kids because they got the same heredity that I did, which comes with this thing of feeling like I should already be good at anything I try to do right away. You know, it's the feeling of, I should be able to do this better. It doesn't matter that I started learning how to do it yesterday. I should already be good at it. And I'm frustrated and angry at myself and angry at the world that I'm not already great at it. My poor mom had to deal with me a lot expressing these things. So similar sort of thing, ah, this new temple doesn't look nearly as good as the one our ancestors built. Never mind the people have been working on it for one month and their ancestors had had seven years and unlimited budget and a huge workforce. Ah, it's not as good, it should be right as good. No, that's unrealistic expectations, guys. So maybe it's a bit unrealistic to expect ourselves to immediately be good at living the Lord's truth only a couple of weeks into the effort, or even a couple of years into the effort. We're probably not very good at it yet, and that's okay. Another challenge that comes up with trying to live what we believe instead of just knowing some stuff is that we end up dealing with real life and real people. Hypothetical life and hypothetical people are way easier to deal with. I like those people. (laughs) Hypothetical people fit into my theories perfectly. They act in exactly the way I expect them to. They are grateful for things I'm doing. It's just, they're so good. Real people are more messy and confusing and complicated and nuanced. And it's like the difference between the theories I might have about how to be a parent versus actually being a parent to my specific children. I suddenly have much less confidence in what I'm doing. I'm way more overwhelmed. And it's just a whole much more confusing and difficult process. I don't look nearly as good as an actual parent as the hypothetical parent I imagine myself to be. Or it's like if you're in high school and you see some people, other students leading clubs or being a captain of a sports team or being on student government, and you think, hey, I could do that. You actually get into that position, it suddenly isn't quite as easy as when we imagined it. 
And in real life, working with real people, there are lots of factors that are outside of our control, not least of which is that the other people have free will, and they can make their own decisions. And so we, or other people around us, can be working pretty hard to do the right thing and follow the Lord and live according to his word, and they can still find their lives to be not looking much like that ideal. And that hurts. And it hurts even more if we're the ones that we knew we messed it up. I did something selfish and I messed the whole thing up. Whew, does that hurt? So if there are real challenges of trying to live our faith in the real world, but it's also part of the beauty of it because it's relevant and the people, rather than being hypothetical, are actual people that matter, you know? <laughs> The, the teachings matter because it affects how I affect other people, and it affects how you affect other people. These teachings make for a better life for people or a worse life for people. So it's much harder, and it's much more worth trying to do. And maybe we can give ourselves and other people a bit more grace when we fall short of those ideals. Maybe we can listen to the prophet of the Lord when he says to us, be strong and keep working for I am with you. So now let's move on to talking about disappointment as a community. The prophet Haggai said to the people, who was left among you who saw this house in its former glory, and how do you see it now? They were feeling pretty bad about how things looked at that point in the history of their people, especially as compared with the past. But for perspective, it's useful to think back in the story to what the first temple would have been like right before it was destroyed by the Babylonians. Those few people who were old enough to remember what it was like were probably remembering it a little bit selectively. They might have remembered it being this beautiful, pristine house of God for the worship of Jehovah, but forgetting that there were many evil kings who worshiped lots of false gods and put idols to other gods in the temple itself and did terrible things in worship of those false gods. And in a similar way, looking back on the history of Bernathan, we might have similar selective memory. The good old days with full church services, and we might forget the not-so-good things that were also going on. Some things back then may have been better to, than today, but some things were worse. It's also useful to fast forward in the story and think about what the temple was like when Jesus was walking around it. Because the temple that they built in Haggai's time was not as impressive as Solomon's temple. But then, hundreds of years later, along came Herod, and he took 46 years to significantly renovate and expand the temple and its complex. And this, by the way, is the same Herod who massacred babies in Bethlehem. So, when Jesus and his disciples are walking around the temple, it was this impressive structure. And the disciples wanted to show Jesus the buildings. And they said, teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And the Lord's response is, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. And in another place, he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up but the text tells us he was talking about the temple of his body. That beautiful building was meant to be a house of prayer for all nations, but had become a den of thieves. So which temple was the best house of the Lord? Was it the one built by Solomon back in the day? Solomon who eventually turned to worshiping other gods? Or was it the one built by murderous controlling Herod so that he would be remembered for his impressive building projects? Or was it the not-so-fancy one built by people who were trying to obey what the prophet of the Lord told them? Now, there may be a time in the future of the Bernathan Church when all the church services are full to bursting again. I hope so, and I hope we get to see it. But somehow, looking at the ebb and the flow of the history of the temple suggests to me that our focus should not be so much on how well or badly we seem to be doing at a particular point in history, but rather on whether we are obediently following the Lord and his word. The people in Solomon's time who got to be alive at that pinnacle of the kingdom of Israel, they were not therefore spiritually superior to the people in Haggai's time or the people in Herod's time. 
And in the same way, we are people at a particular time in the history of the human race, and our task is to simply, humbly try to follow our God, regardless of how well or poorly things seem to be going for the church or for us. The Lord's message to the people who were feeling downhearted was, be strong and work, for I'm with you. There's always good work to be done. And it's easy to get caught up in thinking about how we're doing. You know, am I succeeding or am I failing? Am I better than that person or are they better than me? How's it all going? And it's much cleaner to ask ourselves questions like, am I following the Lord? Am I in integrity? Am I trying to live according to what the Lord teaches in his word? Does the Lord want me to work on becoming a better friend to the people I care about? Yes. Okay, then I'll work on it. Regardless of how good a friend I think I currently am, the Lord wants me to work on that, I'm going to work on that. Does the Lord want me to work on reading his word more consistently? Yes. Even if I'm not as knowledgeable or wise as some other person, still, the Lord wants me to do it, I'm going to work on it. And as a church community, does the Lord want us to be working on supporting each other in our spiritual lives and reaching out to people beyond our community? Yes. Okay, so we'll keep working on that. And when our efforts seem to be successful, great. When they seem to be not so successful, well, we'll keep on working on it and keep on turning back to the Lord. To wrap this up, I want to reflect on one last piece of what the prophet Haggai says to the people. The Lord says he's going to shake things up. Kind of like, I picture it like an old cartoon where some bad guy has stolen some money and then he gets grabbed by the feet and shaken until all the coins come, you know, sprinkling out of his pockets. The Lord says he's going to shake all nations and all nations' glory will come and fill this house that they've built. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And the point of that is that all the success we might long for and never achieve, or that other people might achieve, or all the wisdom and knowledge and goodness and cleverness and all that good stuff, that's all the Lord's. It's all the Lord's. It's not a competition. It all belongs to the Lord, and He wants to share it with everybody. And He'll let us build these puny little houses to Him, and He will fill it to overflowing with His glory, because that's who He is. And then the final thing Haggai says is this. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the first, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Yes, Lord, please let that be so. Give us the strength to humbly keep working, even in the face of challenges and disappointment and apparent failure, so that we can experience some of your glory. But even more so, Lord, give us peace. Give us peace in this place. Amen. We will now have a time for reflection and discussion, if you would like. In the pamphlet, there's a couple questions for reflection and discussion if you want to use them to talk to the people around you for about four minutes. If you'd rather just sit and reflect to yourself, that's also just fine. So four minutes of music to discuss and, and reflect, and then we'll carry on. Thank you. 